is, yeah. All right. Presence and interest is overwhelming today. All right, good afternoon. In um, Cairo, the Secretary General met with the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar um, earlier today. He took the opportunity to reiterate his respect for Islam and his solidarity with the Muslim community around the world, particularly in light of the terrorist attack in Christchurch in New Zealand. The Secretary General stressed that in this time of difficulties and divisions, we must stand together and protect each other. He also commended the Grand Imam's call for Muslims in the Middle East to protect Christian communities, as well as the initiatives taken by Al-Azhar to promote the true face of Islam and counter violent extremism. Later today, he, met, he will meet with the foreign minister of Egypt, Sami Shukri, and tomorrow he's expected to meet with President al-Sisi of Egypt. On a related note, the Secretary General, in a video message today, said that the world must stand together to protect all religious sites against rising anti-Muslim hatred, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, racism, and hate speech. He said we must counter those who seek to demonize and divide, and we must defend freedom of religion and belief. This morning, the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, addressed a special session convened by the UN Economic and Social Council uh, President to the res uh, on the response to Cyclone Edai. The Deputy Secretary General said that three weeks since Cyclone Edai struck Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, the needs remain profound, and she flagged the continuous risks of more floods, spread of diseases, and the destructions of uh, livelihood, as well as lives lost. The Deputy Secretary General paid tribute to the local, national, and international responders who have been on the scene from the earliest moments of the crisis. She called on member states to fund the $392 million response for the three countries over the next three months. Just $46 million has been recorded so far. She reiterated the commitment of the UN to supporting those who are affected in, in the affected countries to rebuild their homes and communities. Also, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lowcock, also addressed the meeting, and he too stressed the need for more funding to the response. And on the ground, the World Food Program reports it is capitalizing on receding floodwaters in Mozambique and now aims to reach 1.2 million people this week with food assistance now that roads are opening up in the worst affected provinces. The agency has provided food assistance to 350,000 uh, victims in the worst um, in Mozambique. And WFP adds that at least 500,000 hectares of crops, primarily maize, were washed away ahead of the main April and May harvest. Our humanitarian colleagues say that more than 1,000 cases of cholera, including one fatality, have been reported in Mozambique, and that's according to the Mozambican Ministry of Health. Over 90% of the cases were reported in Beira. Nearly 900,000 doses of the cholera vaccine procured by UNICEF and the World Health Organization arrived in Beira today. An oral cholera vaccination campaign is scheduled to begin tomorrow, and training for medical personnel is underway. WHO says it de has deployed experts, including epidemiologists, logisticians, and disease prevention experts to build a 40-strong team that will help restore primary care services destroyed by the cyclone. And a new report launched today by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Program, as well as the African Union, finds that 113 million people in 53 countries experienced acute food insecurity in 2018. That's down slightly from 124 million in 2017. According to the report, nearly two-thirds of those facing acute hunger are in just eight countries, and those are Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Climate and natural disasters pushed another 29 million people into acute food insecurity last year. In a message on the launch of the report, the Secretary General said, the report highlights the plight of millions of people who must fight every day against severe hunger and malnutrition and points the way towards solutions that can rebuild lives and livelihoods in communities around the world. The Secretary General stressed that determined action is needed to uphold last year's UN Security Council condemnation on the use of starvation as a weapon of war. That full report is available to you. And uh, the Central Emergency Response Fund, otherwise known as SURF, and the Somali Humanitarian Fund yesterday released a combined $45.7 million to scale up life-saving assistance in Somalia. 
In the country, uh, there are more than 4.2 million people who need urgent humanitarian assistance this year alone, including 900,000 acutely malnourished children. Overall, 4.9 million Somalis are estimated to be food insecure following poor seasonal rains, the lingering effect of the 2016-2017 drought, as well as conflict, displacement, and evictions. Nikolai Mladenov, the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, today said in a statement that the UN and its partners have mobilized nearly $45 million that will allow for the creation of approximately 20,000 temporary jobs in Gaza this year. He added that improved electricity supply has positively affected the delivery of basic services and operations of water and wastewater facilities. Mr. Blanov said significant progress on the lifting of the closures and advancing intra-Palestinian reconciliation remains essential. He called on all Palestinian factions to engage in earnest with Egypt on reconciliation efforts. He also welcomed Israel's decision to increase the fishing zone to 15 nautical miles in certain places and urged substantial improvements on the movement and access of goods and people, including between Gaza and the West Bank. The special coordinator reiterated that ultimately only one sus sustainable political solution will reverse the current negative trajectory and restore hope to Gaza's long-suffering population. His statement uh, was issued a day after he himself visited Gaza. And today in uh, Finland, members of the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation and those of the Global Tech Panel convened by the European Union's High Representative, Federica Mogherini, met together for the first time. The meeting took place at the invitation of Finland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The two panels focused their discussions on global governance in the digital age and how societies can prepare for challenges and opportunities ahead, including those emerging from artificial intelligence and data. They also looked at practical ways to leverage digital technologies to achieve the sustainable development goals. As a reminder, the Secretary General established the high-level panel on digital cooperation to make recommendations on how to strengthen international cooperation in the digital age with the aim to realize the potential of digital technologies while safeguarding against risks and unintended consequences. Back here, Izumi Nakamitsu, the High Representative for Disarmament and, uh, and in Disarmament Affairs and the International Atomic Energy Agency's Director General, Yukia Amano, currently briefing the Security Council on the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The Ms. Nakamitsu told the Council that the NPT is widely acknowledged as the cornerstone of international non-proliferation regime and the essential foundation of nuclear disarmament. She said the NPT has proven remarkably durable, but added that durability should not be taken for granted. Ms. Nakamitsu warned that the disarmament success of the post-Cold War era has come to a halt. In his place, she said, there is a dangerous rhetoric about the utility of nuclear weapons in increased reliance of those weapons in security doctrines. She said that 2020 is the 50th anniversary of the NPT's entry into force, presents a golden opportunity to make the practical gains that will ensure the treaty's continuing viability. A strong political reaffirmation by all of the treaty will be important. Uh, the Director General of the IAEA, Mr. Amano, will speak to you at the Council Stakeout uh, around 12.30. Um, and an event this afternoon in the ECOSOC Chamber, Virginia Gamba, the Secretary General Special Representative for Children Armed Conflict, will unveil a new initiative entitled ACT to protect children affected by conflict to generate greater awareness and action to improve the protection of children affected by armed conflict. Over the next three years, the campaign will seek to strengthen collaboration between the UN, civil society, the international community to support action designed to end and prevent grave violations committed against children in times of conflict. In his message of support to the campaign, the Secretary General said it aimed to raise worldwide awareness to assist children in need and prevent them from becoming victims in the first place. Crucially, the Secretary General said that this initiative will offer children an opportunity to raise their voices. That's at 3 p.m. in Okosok. You're invited. Senior personnel announcement to tell you about today. The Secretary General is appointing Nicholas Kum Kumjan of the United uh, States of America as head of the Independent Investigative Mechanism for Myanmar. Mr. Kumjan will be the first head of the mechanism, which was established, as you will recall, by resolution of the Human Rights Council in September of 2018 and welcomed by the General Assembly in December of last year. Mr. Kumjan brings to his position 35 years of experience as a prosecutor, including 20 years of experience in the field of international criminal justice. 
His bio is in my office. And today we have reached 80 countries on the honor roll. Anybody can guess which is the latest country to have paid in full? Palau. Just trying to keep it interesting. Yes. All right. Any questions? Yes, Evelyn. Sorry. Um, on aid that the UN is gathering up for this cyclone in Zimbabwe, there are reports, especially from Human Rights Watch, that the opposition is being denied some of the humanitarian goods. Do you have anything on that? No, but you we will, we'll look into these reports. It's clear from our end that uh, yeah, also, aid should be completely depoliticized. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the, um, can you tell me again what the Burma mechanism is? Sure, is of course. To prosecute people? Yeah, no, no, of course. The military uh, and so forth? The Human Rights Council established uh, the mechanism in December, in tw September of 2018. The mechanism is mandated to collect, consolidate, preserve, and analyze evidence of the most serious international crimes and violations in respect to Myanmar. Uh, the UN Human Rights Office and the Office of Legal Affairs have been working together to establish the mechanism. The General Assembly uh, also called for the expeditious entry into operation of the mechanism, the steps to secure its effective functioning as soon as possible. Uh, the terms of reference were issued um, early in January. It's not unlike uh, the same mechanism uh, which was approved for, for Iraq. Um, it is about gathering evidence, and we hope that all countries concerned will cooperate actively uh, with the mechanism. Jordan, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, on Milidov visit to Gaza mm -hmm. today, isn't the job creation is part, especially for the population, because it's part of Norwa? Um, no, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's linked uh, to UNRWA, but I will check. Yeah, and also the fund from where he got the fund to create twenty thousand. Uh, the funds were were given by donors. I mean, we have the we can get the list of donors. I think it's through the HLP, the international. I had, let's not burden us with another acronym, but it's through the uh, the group of donors that have been supporting uh, humanitarian and development issues in the occupied Palestinian territory. But we can give you the list. Linda. Uh, thank you, Steph. Following up, <coughs> excuse me, on the question, <coughs> does he, did the SG have any role in bringing about this, uh, the contributions for the jobs in Gaza? Well, I mean, the Secretary General <coughs> has been, uh, has been encouraging donors uh, to give uh, to our humanitarian development work in the occupied Palestinian territory, especially uh, in Gaza, which, as you know, has been suffering from an acute humanitarian crisis. Yes, sir. Um, during his visit uh, or participation in Tunis, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Guterres, did he talk to Arab uh, countries, especially the one who have a lot of money to support in Urwa, and is the UN planning to have uh, another donor conference before uh, UNRWA going to, have to face I'm, a new crisis? Yeah, I'm not uh, aware of any donor conference, but the Secretary General has been uh, actively engaged with member states, both those who've traditionally given to UNRWA and those who have not uh, been traditional UNRWA donors to give to UNRWA. Uh, as you know, he will be uh, going to Jordan. He'll be meeting with uh, the Commissioner General, Mr. Crown Buell. They'll be visiting UNRWA facilities, uh, meeting with children educated by UNRWA. I mean, as, as, as we know, the, the educational mandate of UNRWA is, is so crucial uh, to the to the refugee population that it serves, uh, to, and he'll be going there really to highlight uh, the part of it is the the, the amazing work that UNRWA does uh, throughout the region and its uh, and and how it is in itself a source of stability, and he will also be there to highlight uh, the financial needs, the ongoing financial needs of the organization. There are many concerns among Palestinians. Uh, Jordan, everywhere in the world, especially refugees, uh, about lack of fund to UNRWA. Now, the visit by Miladov to Gaza today and announcing that he's temporarily creating 20,000 
job, which in many ways, 75 to 80 percent of uh, Gaza population are refugees. One of the mandates of UNRWA to create jobs to the refugees. And the concern is that is the UN is starting to stop funding. They will continue to stop the refugee, but stop funding UNRWA and no, no, giving I mean, the I, mandate I think, to Milidov? No, no, no. I, I think you're, uh, if, I may, if I may characterize your question, I think you're over-interpreting things. Uh, first of all, it's not the UN that funds UNRWA. It's the member states that fund UNRWA and that fund the UN. And we are encouraging and actively encouraging member states to fully fund UNRWA. Again, for the reasons that I said, it, it, it most important that UNRWA is a source of stability in the region uh, and in, in the conflict that is so lacking a, a political solution uh, so far. The I'm not... You may be right, but I'm not sure that UNRWA is mandated to create uh, jobs. UNRWA is mandated to take care of the refugee uh, population in terms of education and health uh, and other sectors, and they, and they do that. Uh, Mr. Mladenov's efforts should in no way be seen as a move of taking monies from UNRWA to other parts of, of the UN. His work is complementary to what UNRWA is doing. Halas, thank you all. See you mañana.